What's up guys, it's Carl here at Rare Candy and today I am bringing you the 2019 Latin America International Championship aka Brazil International Meta Discussion here and I'm joined by three really great players who've been putting a lot of time into testing, really putting a lot of effort and energy into understanding where the metagame is going to be going here in the future as we head toward Brazil, head toward Daytona Regionals at the end of the month, and then head toward San Diego and really close out this year with all these standard events that we have coming up. So you guys know by now, I like to do my introductions um, personally, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the three guests that we have, and we're going to hop right into some Cosmic Eclipse stuff. So first I have John Ang, guy who really doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, a month ago, you might have seen him get second place at Knoxville Regionals. Um, also a writer for six prizes, and he's done a lot of stuff in a relatively short amount of time in the Masters division, including 11th overall in North America in the 2018-19 season. So John's a guy that I like to have on the on the discussions every so often because he tests a lot. He's, uh, he's very friendly and forthcoming with his ideas, and I think he's going to be able to put a lot toward this particular discussion. So we got John. Next, I have Darren O'Meara. Um, Darren... Uh, top eight at the Nashville Open last year, really kind of announcing his place uh, in the game overall, which led to him actually achieving the stipend for Australia last year. And if you recognize Darren's name, that might be because uh, he had a really good day one in Australia last year, finishing as the first overall seed heading into day two. Now, if you ask him, he might be a little... You know, he might have some choice words about how he did the day after that day one, but to me, that's just a glaringly huge accomplishment that I think warrants a lot of praise. So Darren also uh, is a writer for some popular websites on the internet that create content, and also recently, just like John, did pretty well at Knoxville. Darren got top 32 at that event. So Darren, over the past year, doing a lot to make his name known in the game, and somebody that I talk to pretty frequently and like to hang out with. Great guy to have on the cast. And then lastly, I have Cameron Shinoy. Cameron is one of the first friends I actually ever made in the trading card game. He plays out in the Bay Area over on the West Coast. And uh, Cameron brings a lot of valuable information to, to this meta discussion in particular because in addition to being really good himself, he plays a lot with some great top-tier West Coast players like Keon and Finn. Um, so... Cameron, not going to the event, unlike John and Darren, but has put a lot of time into testing in this format, and I think that he's going to have a lot of pretty neat stuff to say. So, Darren, John, Cam, it's a pleasure to have you guys on here. It's, um, you know, I know it's kind of short notice. We have Brazil in a couple days. You guys are leaving in a couple days, but I'm really excited to, to pick your brains here and talk a little bit more about Brazil and Cosmic Eclipse. It's the biggest set we've ever gotten. There's a ton of stuff to explore and work on and try to break. And I think we're gonna I know I'm I think we're gonna have something like pretty pretty neat here by the end of it, once I get all your thoughts on just all the cards that could potentially be played or tooled around with. So I wanna hop right into it. I wanna get your initial thoughts on Cosmic Eclipse as a whole, where we were when things kind of got announced where you are now after playing a couple games just any thoughts you have just broad overall thoughts on the set i'm gonna go ahead and throw it over to john let you start it off pikachu is dead now and i'm sad <laughs> is that the prevailing theme because like i've seen people tweet about it and talk about it and then as we'll talk about later tord has it in tier one on his tier list and like i feel like there's a lot of back and forth with pikaram it's like the most it's like the most polarizing deck uh, I think why Tord has is there is because it's uh, it's inherently a really good deck. Like in comparison to like the other decks that he has lower on the tier list, ha like you'll notice that like in the past they've definitely had con either either like brand they're either brand new decks or in the past they've had consistency problems. So I think Pikachu is so high because it's just inherently good and consistent, and it can kind of hold its own. Like you can stick someone with the reset stamp and just run them over. But um, I've the like his tier list. I've the, his top three decks are the. Top three decks that I've been testing, Pidgey. Uh, it's probably my favorite deck right now. Mewtwo is a close second. And then ADP is in the back. I'm still working and toying around with my list for that. Yeah, I mean, from my own playing, like ADP has proven to be just so stupid powerful. Um, but then again, I haven't put as much time into these decks as, as you three probably have. So, Darren, do you have any thoughts on, like, how did you feel when Cosmic Eclipse got announced? Do you have any thoughts now? Do you think the game's changing, becoming more quick? Anything like that? Well, the game's definitely changing. I mean, like, 
ADP being able to take four prizes on tag teams, that's literally one tag team and a Dene kill, and we have great catcher, is, like, huge. And not just that. Well, I know when the set got announced, I was, like, super pumped. I'm like, oh, cool, look at all these Malamar cards. <laughs> and then Malamar is, like, not even, like, the best deck anymore. Well, no. I've tested so much of it. It got the Blown, you know, it has pieces. It's just everything else got too many pieces. And I think that speaks on, like, the set itself, the fact that it can obscure a set not because it has like a hard counter or obscure a deck not because it has the hard counter because everything else just got so much support that it just makes it not as good that's a super good point like sometimes we get the set list and we're like oh my god like this is the tool that my deck needed my vika bolt deck needed rosa for example and then i'm like oh <laughs> but wait <laughs> but wait uh, everything else, every other GX centric tag team centric deck got literally eight more cards. So I'm kind of in the same position that I was in, except a little worse. So like, I think we get excited about new cards that come out and like, they're really cool to conceptualize and like mess around with in our head. And then we don't realize the gravity of like, oh, this GX lets me take an additional prize. And like, you're like, okay, well, I guess I should figure out something else. Um... Cameron, do you have any thoughts? I know you've been really toying around with the set for a while. Anything initially when it came out? Any any thoughts that have changed from then to now, just in your testing or anything like that? Um, I kind of similar to what they said. I you know ADP is cool and all, but just the amount of cards that help already good archetypes is pretty impressive. Um, a lot of unique cards that do interesting things. Um, Lily's Poké Doll, the new Manaphy. Uh, Braxton Zard, just all these cards. Mal and Lana, I think, is maybe not underrated at this point anymore, but before, you know, I think it's one of the stronger cards in this set that just does a lot of work for tag team decks. Um, so a lot of these strong cards, maybe only one one to two new archetypes that are really strong, but just everything else has been kind of buffed, which is really cool. Yeah, I mean, there's just... It's such a fun set, you know, like, everybody who knows me knows that I love a good Stage 2 Pokemon, and while they're not anywhere near, they're not even included in many people's tier lists, it's just fun to, it's kind of fun to tool around with that kind of stuff now and then when you want to break from taking, you know, four prizes with uh, Arceus or something like that, you know, it's just kind of, it's just a lot there, and I, and a lot of people tend to complain about these big sets from what I could see, like, pull rates and stuff like that, like, people who actually buy sealed products, but as far as the players go, there's, they just give us so much. Like, formats generally feel stale at the end. Like, I know this, this format for me was feeling kind of stale. But, like, it's kind of hard to have that happen now that we have just so many things. And, like, the format could be solved, and then, like, we, get, we have, like, oh, there's, like, these 50 other cards that nobody's ever really played around with that probably warrants some testing, so... I love every... I, I mean, I really love the direction the game is going in, and we'll probably talk about that toward the end, but... The the crux of today's discussion that I want to talk about is um, Tord's tier list. And most of us know that Tord put out a tier list a couple days ago, and uh, it pretty much outlines what we all think are going to be the viable decks in Standard. Um, so I want to start with tier S. We're going to start with Darren. Um, so, uh, Darren, Tord has Birds, Arceus, and Mewtwo in his S tier, a.k.a. the most broken decks you could play. How do you feel about those decks and... Do you agree with that with that decision by Tord to put them all in tier S? Uh, for those three specifically, absolutely. Uh, Birds is broken. It always has been. And until we get like a hard counter or a Rangaroo gets banned, it will be. Uh, <laughs> if people play it correctly, like it can't be pretty much anything except for Nag Quag. I, uh, <laughs> I've even had Ian tell me that like he can do it anyway. Um, <laughs> The deck has so many pieces and so many options, and it's infinite loops will always be good, and just stopping your opponent from playing the game is, like, they can't play the game. They can't win, obviously. Um, moving on from that to Mewtwo, um, I've recently been talking with some friends, and the biggest thing that I was worried about with Mewtwo was just uh, Lopany. But yeah. uh, a lot of people have been telling me that it, it, like the deck can play around it. Uh, I actually haven't tested a new version of it yet, but from what I've been hearing, it's really good. Conceptually, it seems really good. Uh, especially against stuff like ADP, where it has to take uh, essentially two turns to set up. Because uh, once they use their GX attack, you just pop it with a Flare Blitz GX. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Arceus uh, was the last one. 
yeah, that ADP is uh, if you get off the turn one altered creation, it's broken because, like I said a bit earlier, you kill a tag team, kill a Dene, and uh, it's over. Uh, it autos, it pretty much, it, if you get the turn one, it autos like one prize deck, so you only need to kill three of them. Um, Malamar just gets absolutely rolled. Uh, it's kind of not biggest threat anymore, but um, it rushes PG harder than other things. Uh, I, it's definitely a threat. I think those three belong in S, and I'd also make a case for... Uh, I need to do a bit more testing on this, but I think Blounds, like big Blounds, could be up there. Mm -hmm. Depending on how tag team heavy this meta is, which I think it's going to be very tag team heavy, I think Blounds can definitely capitalize on that. Especially with Island Amulet. Yeah. Do the extra turn of Beast Ring turns, which is really good. Yeah, that's a really good point. I talked about that in my own personal podcast a little bit <laughs> that I posted a little while ago. And I think that that is a deck that is just very slept on. But we'll we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Cameron, any any uh, deviation from you as far as tier S goes, or do you agree with things generally? Yeah, I mean, I agree with it. I I do think while ADP does apply pressure, I've been favored against it with birds. I, um, and that's truly one of the hard matchups for ADP in my opinion so far. Um, I think you could potentially put Abilities Art up there in S tier, but it is a little bit more run hot than the others, so I can kind of just see it staying in tier one as well. But I think Nine Tails is still really strong, um, especially if you hit your welders. <laughs> a tail is all this time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's been the whole season so far. John, do you have any do you have any uh, dissenting thoughts from there, or are you just kind of set on Birds and Mewtwo and ADP being like S tier? Uh, I pretty much agree with what everyone said. Uh, Birds definitely belongs there. It's the best deck by miles. Um, Mewtwo can compete. Like I said, one of the big selling, like uh, like Darren said rather, one of the big selling points that it can just blow up an ADP on command. Um, and then the Pidgey matchups up for debate. I know a lot of the Pidgey players back at like Knoxville and Atlantic City were like, yeah, their hardest matchup is Mewtwo. So it having I guess slightly favorables against the other S tier decks is really good. Um, as for ADP, I yeah I, I don't think like without a Zebstrika line it cannot beat Pidgey. Like even though you get like the early aggression, you need to like run very hot and they need to draw onto like not a lot of good stuff. And I, I like I said, I think Zebstrika in ADP will beat Pidgey, but past that, I'm pretty sure Pidgey still beats it. Interesting. Okay, cool. ADP is the worst of like the S tier decks, but it's still obviously. Yeah. yeah, you guys generally agree with that. ADP is the worst of the S tier, but still pretty good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And, okay. it can, and he's right about the the Mew box playing around low punny because I play Jirachi and you just play Malmo and Lana's now, and so you can kind of uh, beat you know just Malamar. Uh, you can get around like not playing the Denny's as much mm -hmm. um, and survive that kind of low punny pressure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Cool. Okay, so moving on to tier one, which is funny to say, um, we have Blacephalon. <laughs> Guardian, so Blacephalon GX, rather. Uh, Guardian, Picaram, and Ability Zard. Now, I feel like people look at Picaram and Ability Zard and think, like, oh, that's so last format. They're probably they're probably a little bit too high, that kind of thing. I feel like Guardian gets a ton of tools to play with. That makes it pretty good. And I always feel, in every format, that Blacephalon is just slept on for whatever reason. Um, so Cameron, do you, what are your thoughts on those, those four decks? Do you have any, do you think that they belong there or that they should be higher? You know. So the two, um, abilities are, I've talked about a little bit. It's, I think it's really good. Um, I think you just need to hit your welders, which can be pretty annoying sometimes. I haven't really tested Blounds, but the other two, Picarom has the same problem it's had last format. It takes, it kind of blows out all the bad decks and kind of mediocre decks and then takes pretty hard matchups to what is the best decks and i think it kind of just still has that i do think if you play if you build picarom correctly it, it could be still be pretty good for the meta the thing is it just also has to hit the most compared to all the other tag team decks like it has to just hit the most pieces guardian I, just in general, I don't really like Green's deck's placements uh, in the meta right now. I think you just take a hard L to Pidgey, and then ADP is hard. Um, and then Mew Box is, from my, my testing, is at least a 50-50. So I, I do agree that Guardian's better than Green's Zard right now, just because of the, some of the tools it has. But um, 
just in general, greens don't seem that great right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. John, what about you? Any thoughts on, on Blounds or Guardian, Picaram, Ability Zard? Okay, so as for Tier 1, uh, I've never been a huge fan of High Roll Welder, so I just have never liked Ability Zard. Mm-hmm. There was like a long period of time, like the first cups of the season, where I was like, oh, this deck's broken, and then I just got destroyed at all those cups because I just never hit Welder, so I put that deck back on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, Pikachu, as, as sad as it is, it just, it, it can't be low punny. Literally, there's no way to play around it. Like, you need to have four GXs in play. Like, a Dedenne, a Zeraora, a Pikachu in the active, and then something on the bench to full blitz, too. Um, Blounds, it, it gains the, the amulet thingy. Yeah. But I still don't, I, I, I think it's favored against Mewtwo. I don't think it can beat Pidgeotto. I'm, I'm pretty sure it can't. And then... I'm trying to think if there's like a weird if there's anything cool that like ADP can do against it like kill a Poipol before you use the GX attack use the GX attack then kill like a Dedene and then like you can still skip Beast Ring I don't know that actually seems pretty good yeah um they have Welder so they can be pretty aggressive but so like maybe they can still pull off a KO on the thing but if you can like I think you can still skip Beast Ring I, I, I've never played this in my life this is just all theory and then uh, Guardian, I, I, it's just the same thing. It's a green stack, like Cameron said. I, I don't think they're positioned very well right now. There is no way in hell Guardian is ever beating Pidgey. And I'm pretty sure AD, ADP can just play like a Lucario and Melmetal GX. And then yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, that's been a hard lesson for me to learn so far. <laughs> Had to put that one back on the shelf. Um, Darren, any thoughts on those four decks that... You know, I know you talked a little bit about um, Big Blounds, but what about the other couple? Yeah, so Guardian, uh, you take Pidgey out of the meta completely, and Guardian is S tier probably. But with Pidgey okay. literally existing, it's not as good. Just Greens decks in general, just taking an absolute auto to any kind of control is not something I'd be willing to do going into LAIC now that people are respecting Pidgeotto more and that people will like actually play it. Yeah. Um, Pika can't play around Lopini. Uh, that's been talked about. Uh, Blounds Island Amulet gives you Beast Ring turn. ADP does seem a bit sketchy because they can do something like that to you, and they they can play around you. But um, it's kind of just who hits what. Uh, the game can get awkward as Pokemon does a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, but don't they just go into Keldeo? Like don't they, um, don't they just go into Keldeo and then you can't hit it? Yeah, stuff like Keldeo makes it really awkward. You start pinging around it with Naga GX or Turkey pointing it. It's like black. What was the last deck in tier one again? Oh, abilities are. Abilities are. Carl knows my opinion. <laughs> I hate the deck. They're not high. <laughs> I played it in Atlantic City, and it was probably one of the worst decisions I've ever made. They're not high. Yeah, the only reason I did so well is because I you gave me all your energy after you missed a couple welders. Uh, yeah, well, like, I think a general rule of thumb should be you have to play more su- more than four supporters in your deck for Brazil. <laughs> I'm really hoping you all do, all you watchers out there. Please play more than four supporters. We have so many cool ones now. Like, <laughs> Malo and Lana. You just play one or two game. Malo and Lana. Yeah. yeah four, five or six. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Perfect. So then below that, we have a bunch of weird decks. We have Quagsire, Dollstall. Uh, Baby Blounds and Breaksin, which I would assume is Green's Breaksin Zard. Um, all weird, all very strange, kind of hard to place. I'll go ahead and start with John. Are there any decks you think in this tier deserve to be higher or lower, or anything here worth trying out? I don't think any of them should be higher. I think some should be worth trying out, just to familiarize yourself with like the format and like some of the new tools that some of these decks get. Like, uh, so the Charizard breaks in, like, handlock deck was the first deck that I really, like, noticed from the set that I, like, put time into testing. It's all right. It uh, cannot beat our friend, the bird, Fiji. But um, everything else, it's kind of meh. So, like, cards like Reset Hole are, are, like, are extremely good against it. And then stamping them before you take, like, a big knockout is also pretty devastating, mm-hmm. which is why I think it's so low in the tier list. But it's definitely the first thing that I really noticed, because, like, the attack in, in a vacuum is extremely good. Um, as for Quagsire, it gains red and blue, but I think it's kind of just, like, the same as it was before. It's inconsistent, very setup based on the early turns. 
Um, I actually know nothing about this Florgis Clefairy doll deck. Me neither. Um, but uh, I have, I, I, from first looks, I would assume it does not beat a Rangaroo. And I don't, like, what, here, like, what would they do against a Malamar? Like, so the Tina attacks into it, and, like, the Tina kills itself three times, and then the baby Blacephalon just snipes a whole bunch on the bench, because they're at three prize cards. Like, what does it do against that? You're, uh, you're a really, you're a really smart thinker, John. You're, I have like, to say that that's, uh, that's a pretty cute game plan. Um, I should say that I think Red and Blue only evolves to a Pokemon GX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen so so Quagsire lists are playing like Silvalli, I think, or I've seen some. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that it's only in that tier by virtue of it having a pretty good Pidgey? Uh, I wouldn't say that's the only reason. That's obviously a pretty good selling point for Quagsire. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Honestly. I I personally would never touch the deck. I don't know. I I've I've never played it before. Yeah. But I, I, I that's one of the big reasons. I don't know. I don't think it's very good. I I only think it's there because it has good control matchups. But I don't know. Um, Darren, how about you? So we have Baby Blounds, Doll Stall, Quag, and uh, Greens Breaks and Czar. Do you have any opinion on any of those decks, higher or lower? Yeah. So I don't think any of them should be higher or lower. Um, Greed's Breaks and Zard was something I was theorying with some friends the other day, and we were talking about throwing in a, a 101 Omastar line to beat Pidgeotto. <laughs> and that that's three cards, and there, we can't find the cut. I don't think it's worth it. I don't think the deck's worth it because Greed's decks still don't seem good for LAIC. Yeah. Pidgeotto is pretty good. I mean, they can't hand lock you unless there's something I'm just blatantly missing. Um, but it's Wilders, again. But you'd have Pidgey to support it. Uh, all in all, I actually had the misfortune of playing against him today when I was trying to test Um what the, the answer to what they do when you kill three things is they put a Sky Pillar down and then lose a Mina back. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's still not very reliable uh, because, like, he got lucky and like, milled two of my stadiums. Uh, I don't think it beats Malamar. Uh, I also don't think it beats like Cross Divide or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's also at stage two, and that's unreliable zone, right? Uh, hey, hey, watch it. <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Okay, uh, Cam. Any last thoughts on any of those decks? Uh, they're they're decks that I really haven't played around with too much. I played around with Breaks in. It's pretty cool, but it loses to Stamp Knockout. So, like, do you have any additional info on any of those? I don't know, like, Breaks and Zar just loses to the three top three decks. Quagsire, I think, takes a favorable matchup against Mew Box, too, if it sets up. I think it has a lot of good matchups in the top seven outside of maybe, like, ADP and Guardian. So, I mean, you, you, like, you have some pretty good matchups against five of the seven, mm -hmm. but um, it just needs... It's probably, like, the most inconsistent of any of those kind of seven decks above it. A doll stall, I think you lose to birds, but you can beat Quagsire now, but you have to flip coins, which feels really bad. Um, and then Blounds, Pidgey. Uh, I, just, I, I haven't tested that much, but I don't think... It's okay, but I don't think it's, like... It can lose to birds. It can lose to... Um, it can lose to uh, the Arceus Dialga if they get a bad start, so... Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say with the Blounds Pidgey, do they even have like enough energies to win the game against Pidgeotto? Like, if they like awkwardly discard something with like Bellola and Bryson Man, like, can they even win? No, yeah, the multiple times they've like, I've, I, you know, I just you can Jesse James them, and like a lot of the times they have to discard like Fire Crystals, or you'll just Bryson Man them away. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not a, it's not a good matchup at all. <laughs> yeah, that Bellola Bryson Wait. Man. Say that again, Darren. Say that again. Oh, I just said I don't think it's favored. Yeah. Like, you have Bikini, but I still don't think that's enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so moving on, we have all the the bad decks, supposedly. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just lump Tier 3 and Tier 4 together. So we have Darkbox, Malamar, Reshiram, and Zekrom, Volcarona, Trevenant, and Dustnoyer, and Behem. 
<laughs> is there any merit to any of these decks being placed a little bit higher, maybe in tier two? And um, what makes some of these decks bad to you? Um, so we'll start with Darren. All right, here comes my inherent Malamar bias. Go um, ahead. <laughs> I think it should be in probably in tier two, in my opinion. I don't think it's bad enough to warrant being in like the lowest tiers. Uh, this is probably the deck that I've been testing the most because I want it to work. Uh, <laughs> I landed on what I think is probably the, the best list that it's going to get and still, uh, loses to ADP. Uh, and then also still very much loses to birds, probably harder than it did before. Yeah. Uh, and the list includes a, you play a Lopini and you play a great catcher, just one of each, but because, because it can like Lopini can win games for you. So it makes it so that you can win ADP and stuff like that, but it's still not reliable enough against players that know you play it. Mm -hmm. And it's just overall, it's just kind of underwhelming. The, honestly, the card that kills it the most to me is Milo and Lana. Oh, yeah. Uh, the fact that that card even exists makes the deck just unplayable. <laughs> yeah. it, it heals off an entire turn of Shadow Effect. Uh, <laughs> other than that, everything else in that list seems... Uh, Reshi, Reshi Ram got a lot of hype coming into the set, but it's just kind of underwhelming. I think Blounds is just better than it, and it does what it does better for two prizes. Yeah. Instead of, uh, other than that, everything else is just pretty much, yeah, down there. Okay, cool. Cam, any thoughts on any of those decks? Uh, Dark Box is just a worse Niagara Quag, and Niagara Quag is <laughs> like, okay. Um, it, it actually it loses to birds just because of plant, like the... the mm -hmm. Like its ability, move, uh, the energy mover is uh, susceptible to power plant. Malamar is bad because of Malalana. Uh, Reshi Rom is pretty bad. It's inconsistent. I guess the one merit to it is like you pretty much know if you've won or lost within the first five minutes of the game, and so uh, you won't have very many long games. It can beat some of those top tier decks if it absolutely pops off. But for my testing, it doesn't happen enough. Vol, Corona, and Sil Valley have not tested. Dust Snore is kind of a meme, um, in my opinion. And then this Behem, and then I, I think also you can like throw in Cryogonal Pidgeotto into that like item lock based deck. It takes a pretty hard win to to birds, but that's kind of it. That's like Nagaquag and item lock are some of the things that hurt birds, in my opinion. But other than that, it's yeah. It's, it's fine. Yeah. How about you, John? Any opinions on those six decks? All right. So just like in general, I think they're all garbage. <laughs> but I think some are more garbage than others. So like... Okay. Lay it on me. Fox is like, like he said, slightly worse than Nagquag. I'd put it in like tier 2.5 because it's kind of just like the same thing mm -hmm. pretty much. Except I guess like a worse Pidgey. Uh, it's just super setup based. Uh, Malamar... <laughs> It's just so bad, dude. I, I think the only <laughs> thing it beats, the only thing it beats is Mewtwo. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that is the only thing, and that's some of the time. And then doesn't uh, the Reshi Reshiram like cap at 270? Yeah. Okay, how are you killing an ADP, dude? <laughs> like, yeah, there you go. That, yeah, th and then it uh, bad deck. <laughs> uh, definitely cool. I think that'll be good at some point in time. Definitely not right now, though. I'm going to be honest, I don't know what Trevenant Dustinor does, but it probably sucks. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. So, for three Psychic, it does 150, and you... I think, do you look at your opponent's hand and choose two cards? Or do you choose at random? I think Shuffle it might be. Random. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so two cards from your opponent's hand at random, back into their deck. Um, and then the GX is bad. It For, like, four energy, maybe, it's... You're, you remove all energy from your opponent's bait, uh, active, and then they can't retreat. It, it's like a worse Mewtwo handlock from Expanded. Like, it has yeah. not nearly as many pheromones. You B-string onto Bear, Buzzwolf, Fairy, Mozart, and <laughs> come over after Miss Maggie's That's important. so bad. Basically, that's what you do. <laughs> that's what you do. So, I don't know why Torrid even included it on his tier list, honestly. I... Every time I played against it, there I have no fear. The only two cards in this in the, during this season that somebody's flipped over and I've had no fear, Trevenant and Dustnoyer and Inke. <laughs> no fear. I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, I, I'm so happy when I see those two things. So, John, you are correct. It's not a good card. I 
unless some <laughs> wild stuff happens where like someone like figures something out, which I don't even think is out there right now. I think we've seen the most wild way, which is the whole bee string buzzwool thing, which is like a what is it like a it's eight card combo? You got to find the buzzwool, you got to find the Miss Magius, you have to greens for the well, stuff, I'm... you have to yeah, you got to do a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> So, yeah, you're not missing anything, John, I don't think. All right, um, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm very opinionated on psychic Pokemon because I don't like any of them. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So is there anything from that tier list that we're maybe missing? Are there cards that should be explored more, you think? Do you, is there any one card you think should be tinkered with that could have a hole coming up maybe toward Brazil or after Brazil if the meta breaks a certain way? So we'll go, we'll start with Cameron. I think um, the one deck that has potential to kind of tailor itself to beat the meta is Soul Valley GX, and you just have to figure out um, if you. I mean, if you're willing to take it to LAIC and you think you figure out the meta, then maybe. But I think it's something that once we see LAIC and you see what's really good, you could pair it with like red and blue, and then whatever partner you think does really well against the rest of the meta. Um, that's really Other is that, I, I think it's like it's kind of like Zorark GX where it can kind of tailor itself. I don't think it's nearly as good as Zorark, but it has the ability to kind of play that adapting role in the meta. Um, how good it can be, I'm not sure, but I think it could be decent. Cool. How about you, John? Anything that you think needs to be explored more, or maybe future potential? Uh, I 100% agree with Cam. Uh, in my most recent article, I just like made some like notes and points about the format, and like literally under Sil Valley GX, I was like, this card is good. I don't know what it's good in. But it's good. <laughs> so like I, I the, inherently like in a vacuum, that card is absurd, absurdly good. And if someone figures it out, like power to them because it it's a broken card. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about you, Darren? Uh, same exact opinion. Sil Valley GX is like probably one of the best cards in the set but it's just not we don't really have a way to utilize it without seeing the meta right now mm -hmm. i think i think what before creativity can really happen we kind of need to see what happens in LAIC first mm. yeah that's the thing like it's so it's so hard going into like this blind meta that we had last weekend at uh richmond and like now we're gonna have it again uh, coming up here in Brazil. So, like, this whole month is kind of like the the month of, like, the creativity and, like, who could take the most well-rounded list and get the matchups that they need and kind of tailor their deck to beat 80% of stuff that they could potentially see. But it seems so hard to kind of approach a blind meta that way. So what I want to ask John and Darren is, are there any differences that you make when you make take a step toward playing in a blind meta versus... A more developed one or an established one. So I'll start with John. Like, how do you approach this compared to an established meta? Um, in in this one, in a blind meta, I usually make sure um it's either consistency or control. That's usually like my general mm -hmm. rule when it comes to blind metas and making sure like my deck is inherently good. Like I'm not as much cared about the matchups because, especially for me and Darren specifically, going into like a foreign country where like the majority of the player base is going to be, like, stuff we're not exactly used to. Mm -hmm. Or, like, trying to, like, metagame and stuff like that isn't really as important to me. Just making sure my deck is inherently good and consistent and I'm never really, like, out of a game that I'm playing is generally what I'm looking for what, with what deck I'm playing. Cool. How about you, Darren? Yeah, basically what he said, uh, we're going to Brazil. I don't know what they play. Um, like... I want whatever my opponent flips over is their active. I want to be confident that I can beat that. I want my deck to be able to beat that. Like it might not have to be the most favorable matchup in the world, but I want to know that I can win it. And like, if I play well, like into my outs that I like will win the game. I want to be, I want to have the opportunity to like be a good player. Cool. And like make the correct decisions. Yeah. And I don't want my deck to flop out on me when I'm trying to do that. Either. Right. Cool, so consistency is generally key. Cam, do you have any thoughts about times you've gone into a meta blind before or the differences between a blind meta and uh, a developed one and how you prepare for each one? I, I love blind metas. Like, those are always my favorite events because, in my opinion, it's kind of who has put in the most time. It, John was right. Like, a lot of it is just, like, control and consistency are really strong in blind metas. I think uh, what I like is it could uh, have, like, 50-50 matchups across the board i don't really want to lose um to like too many things and then i just 
I put in enough games where I think I can ha- I'll have like a better list than a good percentage of the players, not all of them, but then that'll like carry you usually through day one. Um, just having like a consistent list that goes 50 50 and then you just trust your skill and the time you put in. Yeah, I think you could inherently win games based off the inconsistencies of other players' lists. And I think that that's where that's why I personally preach so much about preparation. Um, I think that just sets you apart, and especially in a in a meta game like this, like you're gonna play some wild stuff. I would assume at least once or twice, you're gonna be like, "What is even happening?" You might even have to read a card, right? But if your deck kind of just does what it does, more often than not, you're probably gonna win off somebody trying to play two or three techs for different things that probably aren't even really necessary. That I think you'll absolutely see people doing because um, they get in their own head about these kind of blind metas and stuff. It's the same game, right? So um, you guys know by now that I like to always introduce some kind of development, personal development uh, in the game kind of thing. Uh, I always have really, really skilled guests on my on my discussions, and I, again, am in that scenario, and I often like to ask them a small tip or something for people that are watching that they can implement into their routine or their deck building or their play testing that can help them take the next step here, whether it's this year or next year. So why don't I go ahead and start with Darren on this one. Darren, is there a tip you have for somebody who's just trying to get more competitive and get better and make their finishes better or anything like that? Ugh, um, I probably am like the worst person to ask this question because my <laughs> testing habits are garbage and so are my like deck, de- deck making decisions. Um, going oh. off of that, I'd say... Uh, <laughs> lock a deck in and make sure you know how to play it because there's been way too many i think probably twice or three times a season i've uh like had my mindset on a deck swapped at like 11 p.m not known how to play it correctly and or and or the deck just wasn't as good as i thought it was and it just got embodied so just like test figure out what's good uh play what's good and know how to play it awesome i mean that's that's great advice myself i mean that's great advice if i say so myself like I feel like people make 11th hour changes quite literally, and um, it's really hard to do that. Like, it there's a reason why like only the best of the best kind of do that, you know. And um, I've I mean I've noticed you take a giant leap over the past year and a half, so I figured, you know, there'd be I think that's a great nugget of of wisdom, right? Like keep it simple. That's all you have to do. Keep it simple. Um, so that's that's really good, Cameron. How about you? Any any tip for and in, in, in anything relative to getting better at the game that you could put forth? Something that I was talking to Isaiah Williams about recently that I think is pretty uh, something that I'm trying to work on a lot right now is just your mental state in the game, like keeping it very neutral, like in between games. He said that something that he noticed a lot last year. He's taking a break this year, but last year was. Like, a lot of players would just, like, get paired against him. They're like, oh, I guess I, I lost this round. I'm playing against Isaiah. And it's like you already consider yourself out. Or if, like, one thing goes wrong or you lose game one in, like, a tilting way, like, they just – their mind state changes. And then once that happens, like, the mistakes start to pile on after mm-hmm. that. So just being able to – understand what you can control and what you can't control sometimes you will lose to variance because i mean that's that's part of pokemon as a game like you just lose because you drew bad you bricked and you have to like kind of put that to the side and just approach the next matchup with a, a clear state of mind awesome advice dude awesome i think everything about life is in how you prepare and how you deal with adversity and like adversity is going to happen in any game it's a zero-sum game so like somebody has to win and somebody has to lose and the way that you lose could be in a really dramatic or tilting way or an unfair way or whatever the case may be. And you could kind of lose your whole day right there if you let it get to you too much. And I think that's really good advice from you and obviously a really good player, Isaiah, who's done a whole lot of crazy cool stuff in this game. So that's awesome. John, how about you? Anything that you have? I know I've asked you this before. So, um, you know, if you have anything else, that'd be that'd be real good. Um, you know, something simple. <laughs> Um, no, just take everything as a learning opportunity, like every mistake, every success, like every, everything that happens in the game, see if you can like learn something from it or take something like extra from it. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay, cool. I mean, like that's just simple, good advice. I mean, just learn from everything, right? Just cause you lost doesn't mean you really have to get nothing from it. You can take something from pretty much everything. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I look for from my guests. So 
those are three mm -hmm. lessons that I think are super important and things that we should be mindful of going into Brazil and afterward. So now we're at the time of the cast where I want to give you guys the opportunity to shout out and plug whatever it is you want to shout out and plug. I know you guys are writing and creating things and trying to do some stuff in the game for the community to make us all better, help us grow and learn. And um, I want to give you guys the opportunity to shout out whatever it is you want to shout out or whoever it is. So I'll go ahead and start with John. John, uh, go right ahead, man. Uh, make sure you guys check out Six Prizes by Underground. We have a really good article staff right now. We have so many top players, so many insightful writers. So make sure to check us out. Um, currently, I have no sponsor. So if you, uh, uh, yeah. That's criminal. Hey. I think I'm going to. Maybe we'll talk. <laughs> I think I'm going to start doing it. I might just throw you some bills and just send you wherever and then just be like, listen, go do it, John. You're, yeah, you I'll have wear one. a shirt with your face on it. It says like positivity or something. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Easy power, man. Very good. Cool. Uh, how about you, Darren? Uh, all right, for Team Rockets Hideout, uh, I've got a subscription model and a pay-per-view. Pretty, pretty nice. I write every so often. I didn't write for Richmond, uh, and uh, we all know that that didn't turn out very well. Uh, <laughs> but I will be writing for LAIC, and I put a lot. I actually put a lot of time into testing for LAIC. So when that article comes out, uh, look forward to it. Uh, Shout out to the New England homies that I talk with on Discord every five seconds. <laughs> and and uh, especially Ian is in, like, top four of Portland right now or something. Finals. Uh, I haven't looked at up since I started the call, but shout out. Yeah, you know how that's going? <laughs> He's in the finals. Finals? Oh, finals. Yeah. Now, turn up. Yeah, he beat back Danny. To back top eight, right? What was that? Back to back top eights? Question mark? Did he Ian? top eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See? I'm not yeah. sure. Or uh, to Richmond? I don't think so. He, did well. he played a ground Richmond, and now he's in Zorro Garb or something. Yeah, yeah, he did top eight twice. All right, I stand corrected. Good for him. He <laughs> bodied me in AC, so I've kind of shut him out of my mind since that time. <laughs> um, but yeah, cool. Darren's articles and also John's could be had for relatively low price, and they put a lot of work and time. I know that because I sub to both of them. Um, uh, Cam, go right ahead, man. I know you are starting some new stuff, right? Yeah, shout out to the Sylph Company. It's a new team. I've been in charge. I just finally got like most of the team together. Um, we're doing a lot of. We're going to be putting out like streetwear and stuff. We're going to be doing that every quarter, just coming out with new stuff. We have like our first shirt that everyone on the team is wearing, but we're going to come out with some new stuff. Uh, follow us at the Sylph Coke at the Sylph Company on Twitter or me on Facebook, and you can kind of check that out. And you know, we have like some pretty cool stuff coming out. Um, for decent prices, uh, potentially we'll get into content, but uh, look for towards Darren and John and those guys for content for right now. Uh, shout out to Preston for top eighting um, Portland, and shout out to Caden who's also on the team who top sixteen and seniors. But other awesome. than that, that's pretty much it. Awesome, cool. Well, guys. You already know. I'm Carl. I, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a little while now. I love what I'm doing here at Rare Candy. And if you love what we're doing at Rare Candy, you could always follow us on one of these social media links down here. Alternatively, if you want to take it an extra step, you could um, contribute to us on Patreon. Um, I do streaming for Rare Candy on Wednesday afternoons. I also stream myself on my own channel. So if you like any of the content you see here, go ahead and check these guys out on their social media. Check us out at the links down here. And yeah, if you want to take that extra step, our Patreon is always open. So for everybody who's going to Brazil, safe travels, good luck. Play Dexter comfortable with. Learn from these guys. Like, these guys know. Um, so for John, Darren, Cameron, thank you guys so much for joining me. You guys have a lot of really valid and great opinions about the entire meta. And I certainly think I've learned a lot um, just from listening to you guys. And I'm sure everybody else out there has too. So for John, Darren, Cam, I'm Carl. It's been fun. Good luck in Brazil. Good luck and beyond. Keep grinding. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.